morning, everyone. Uh, today, on behalf of the ISIS, I would like to welcome you all for the public forum on reconciliation and charter chain underpinnings and scenario. Uh, I would first, I would like to ask uh, Professor Dr. Supachaya Wapapa, the Dean of Faculty of Political Science, to give us the welcome remarks. Good morning. Excellency, distinguished guests, uh, distinguished panelists, friends and colleagues, it is again my honor to welcome all of you to this important event. Today is this a public forum on reconciliation and charter change, underpinnings and scenario. I think uh, from the topic itself, uh, it is very timely and um, I trust that you will hear a very uh, stimulating, informative, as well as very intellectual discussion this morning. So I think uh, uh, I should leave you to listen to all the panelists. Uh, and welcome again and hope that you will uh, come to ISIS Public Forum uh, next time. Thank you very much. The program today, we will have uh, our speaker to speak. Uh, if anyone wants to speak to Ra, it will be 15 minutes and then another five minutes as a conclusion. But uh, most of our speaker would like to speak in one round uh, for 20 minutes. And then we will start with Q&A. It's an honor for me to have a chance to speak in front of uh, such a distinguished uh, audience again on the uh, public forum program of ISIS. The issue today, like uh, the Dean uh, once uh, said a moment ago, that this is timely. I don't know whether it's timely or not, because uh, somebody told me some days ago that uh, don't expect that it's going to be a new constitution very soon. That's what they said to me. No, no. Uh, uh, there's no hope for that, but they said. Okay, nevertheless, you see, the issue of the, how to rec reconcile conflicts in our society is uh, how to uh, work it out with the efforts to, uh, to change the constitutions or to uh, write a new one seem to be an issue of the day. And uh, the publics uh, are now waiting for the court, the constitutional court decisions uh, to make a rule on the issue whether the, the bill to, to change the charter uh, is uh, constitutional or not. Uh, at the same time, the people also uh, expect anything to come out on the issue of the reconciliation bills, uh, to what extent it would be able to pass the, uh, the parliament and becomes a law. The problem is to what extent these the efforts uh, to launch a charter change as well as uh, to uh, enact the so-called reconciliation bills would resolve conflict in Thai society. Let me go straight to the point. In my views, it cannot be achieved uh, through the reconciliations cannot be achieved through legislations. First of all, let me take the issue of reconciliation first. Uh, because, you see, legislatures, or if you want to enact something into law, it has to be uh, able to enforce. Uh, uh, so the reconciliations cannot be forced by the law. I would say that uh, if you really want to reach a reconciliation or to try to resolve conflicts between the parties concerned, uh, you need uh, to do something like you have to provide a favorable or suitable political environment and you have to be sure that consensus of the parties in conflicts uh, to agree with the reconciliations is possible. At the moment, you can see there's no real consensus on the 
on on the party concern uh, to have reconciliations. So I would say that uh, if you really want to do something in terms of uh, enacting a law, hoping that uh, the law would help to reconcile the, the the conflict in our society, I don't think it would work. Let me go into something like. Uh, uh, somebody has said before that the proposed uh, reconciliation bills and the effort to enact a new constitutions uh, by the government parties only leads to a more serious conflicts and worsening political situations. Even the reconciliation law is passed the conflicts and division in our society would uh, continue. Why can I say that? We have to look at the root causes of the conflict first. One of the causes of the conflict between the two camps, I say, would be uh, the groups divide among the high society is a pro or against taxing. You know that. See, it's a for or against taxing. But not only that, I would say that another factor is the ideological conflicts uh, between the two movements which divide our society at the moment. Is the ideological conflict between the so called Red Church uh, movement and uh, another conservative forces? between the two groups, you see. Uh, the hard core of the Red Church movement uh, want to see a radical or revolutionary change in Thai society. In other words, that they want some sort of the overall uh, change in a very uh, revolutionary way. And the conservative force prefer moderations and gradualism in the political changes and they would like to keep uh, major in traditional institutions uh, to be upheld. So this is the thing uh, seem to be a conflict in the past uh, I would say the six or seven years ago. Uh, let me look at the, at the, red, at the so-called Red Church movement first. On the surface, it looks like that. The Red Church is winning in their efforts uh, to launch a campaign to change the Thai society because they are in the government and they control the majority in the parliament. And in addition, the movement is very popular in the north, the northeast, and as well as very popular in the people in the lower strata of Thai society. If you talk to the people it, in Bangkok, the people who uh, drive taxis, uh, the shop vendors, small shopkeepers, construction workers, as well as the uh, the the how do you call it motorbikes uh, riders. You see. They are in favor of the Red Church. They agree uh, with what the Red Church is moving and doing. Uh, but if you look uh, deeply uh, in the movement, uh, uh, you can see some sorts of the uh, some sorts of uh, conflict among itself. Uh, see, uh, the movement is far from consolidations. Uh, they are not really uh, unify themselves to such an extent that kind of be uh, a monolithic uh, movement to launch a radical campaign. Uh, the movement is uh, composed of various factions with uh, different political views and interests. Uh, ranging from the extremist hardcore uh, to a wealthy businessman group. So you can see how, how the two extremes 
work together, it's not very difficult to see in any country except in Thailand that you have the, the so-called the revolutionary people who used to work in the countryside during the 1960s and in the 1970s who work in the uh, with the cop uh, against the establishment uh, in the 1960s and in the 1970s and now they are they have been granted pardons and now they work with a wealthy businessman uh, like Kun Taksin and his alliance and his colleagues you see it's quite unlikely to happen in any other countries but it's quite strange that it is now working in 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 the case of Thailand you see uh, it's a become a big united front uh, this uh, the so-called uh, uh, Richard movement uh, they seem to agree among themselves to work together for a time being as a united front first of all because they continue to uh, uh, to respect uh, Kun Taksin they continue to accept the leadership of Kun Taksin and perhaps uh, his financial power as well you see I don't know uh, but that's for a time being and Kun Taksin know very well that if he really want to come back and if he really want to establish, re-establish himself as a political leader, he needs mass support. And where he can get it, he can get it through the Red Shirt Movement. So a kind of some source of common interest between Kun Taksin and, uh, uh, and the extremist group uh, in the Red Shirt Movement. And at the same time, the movement, particularly the, the extremists, uh, want uh, Kun Taksin wealth to finance their political campaign. And that's why Kun Taksin need to strengthen his alliance with a number of his business colleagues only to make it sure that his uh, political patronage is working well for his interests and the movement interests. But the question is how long this would be, uh, uh, how long uh, these uh, cooperations uh, would be in the existence uh, it's quite interesting to look at this, you see. And uh, on the other side of the Thai society, you can see a, a conservative forces. At the moment, they are, I would say, uh, they are a minority in the parliament, but uh, they, are, they are trying to work together, you see. Like uh, the Democrats, is there more or less a political arms of the conservative groups? Which is no surprise because if you look at the the Democrats Party at the beginning in 1946, uh, the Democrats organized themselves to be the party as the opposition to Kun Pridi Panom Jong, who was uh, at, the term, at that time the leader of a socialist camp. Uh, so the, the Democrats uh, announced themselves as a pro-royalist conservatives and liberal. Uh, they are against the military uh, domination as well as again the socialism in the country. So that's the ideology of the of the Democrats all along. Uh, somebody might think that if they are able to keep themselves liberal, how come they work uh, with the military in to some extent in the past uh, four or five years? Well, it might be some source of common interest. Uh, for them to work together in order to be an opposition to any uh, development by the so-called uh, leftists or the revolutionary movement within the Red Shirt itself. Uh, so, so they try to work it together with the establishment. But again, you see, they are not strong enough to become a majority in the parliament. They are not strong enough in order to win the public support. This is the point where the public, uh, the question is where the public stands. They are for the red shirt, they are for the conservative, or they try to be um, for themselves.
but the question is, you see, it's not very easy to 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 see to see how the public stand on the conflict among these two camps. Uh, the Democrats and the conservatives uh, try to get the so-called public or the silent, quote-unquote, silent majority to their side, uh, hoping that uh, their strength would be increased if the public go with the, the conservative side. Uh, you can see that uh, on the one hand, the, the conservative force can convince the public that the reconciliation uh, bills which uh, seem to be in favor of uh, taxins and uh, red shirts rather than, nobody, uh, rather than anybody else. Uh, so this is, if you talk to the people in the public, the moods is something like that. You see, oh, the bills, the reconciliation is not, is, is, uh, ne is, uh, is not a reconciliation at all. Uh, it's just a effort uh, on the government parties uh, to bring Kuntaksin back and some sort of okay and we'll try to give something uh, back to the conservative force as well but the, the real issue, the real agenda is uh, try to uh, bring him back. So that's the way the conservative force is try to convince the public and it seems to, uh, to, to be able to sell well, um, and uh, the the Red Church movement or the Pur Thai parties and the government parties' effort to write a new constitution uh, is also uh, is not uh, transparent. That what the conservative force trying to convey the message, because since it was initiated by the political by a, a political parties some political agenda is there so there may be some sort of hidden agenda and it seem to 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 agree with that i i seem to agree, uh, agree with that because i i've been involved uh, uh, in the writing constitutions for three three constitutions so far and I hate to write it again, so don't ask me to write it, this new one. I don't like it, I see, because I don't think the new constitution will resolve any problem in the country. Uh, the thing is, whenever we have a new regime, either through a coup or through a elections, whatever it is, you see, the new groups in power wanted a new constitution to strengthen their power. So everything we write a constitution, we always have some sort in mind, those who are in power. So when I, when I was invited to write a constitution, to help write a constitution in 1991, I see, I was informed by my colleague who sit with me, who sat with me together in the committee that uh, there was a directions or directives from the military juntas, what they want to see in the constitution, what they want to see in the constitution. But it didn't how to be that our committees didn't do anything that the military like it. So when we finished and we proposed the draft to the legislature, which was dominated in 1991 by the military people, they amended I mean, up to the point that my original draft disappeared. It turned out to be something quite strange uh, for me as well. And But how about in 1997 constitution? It's quite a unique because 1997 constitution was not initiated by any political parties in power. They never proposed it. They never initiated it. It was proposed by a group of intellectual, academic people and NGOs who wanted to see more democratic constitutions. But even so, there was some sort of blueprint among the scholars themselves, how uh, a, a blueprint for the new constitutions. And let, let alone in 19, uh, uh, and 2007 constitutions, you see. Uh, is also the same. 
nevertheless, so so when never uh, the constituents were proposed by a political party, that party has agenda within it. So the people never believe that this kind of thing would be good for the country, because so this is quite something that uh, lack of confidence among among each group, you see, um, among themselves. So. Uh, as for the constitutional court's ruling on the bill to change the charter, well, I don't want to predict. <laughs> it's not very easy to predict, you see. Uh, but I would say that uh, no matter what the ruling would be, things will not get better. For instance, if the court, if the court rule the bill is not unconstitutional, the parliament will proceed to the establishment of the constitutional drafting assembly whose member will be elected nationwide. And we cannot believe that uh, the election would be far from politicizing, would be far from political domination. You see, uh, so, so to, you cannot say that uh, uh, Political parties has uh, have nothing to do with it. That's almost impossible to say this in the case of Thailand. Uh, so the, if this happens, then the protest will be again in the future against the the the, the working of the assemblies as well as the new charter. And if the court rules the bill unconstitutional. Aha, uh -huh. that's quite interesting. You see, we don't know what happened. I'm not an astrologer, I don't know. But we can predict that some sorts of protest will occur, some thoughts, whether this would lead to violence or not, I don't know. Because at the moment, the constitutional cause has been attacked of intervening in the legislature. There has been attack that they have uh, mobilized by some political forces, particularly the conservative forces. Although the, the courts always said that uh, they are free from political meddling, but the, see, the people uh, who are against the court continue to campaign for this. And I don't know, uh, perhaps uh, what happened this day that the people seem to be relied everything to the court, either the constitutional courts, administrative courts, or courts of justices, because they believe that they cannot trust anybody except the courts. They cannot trust the election, they cannot trust politicians, they cannot trust uh, government officers, they cannot trust uh, cabinet members, they cannot trust people in the cabinet or the prime minister. So they want to throw everything to the courts to decide. Uh, so the courts, the, the court system, is the victims of its goodness, of its cleanliness, you see. So when they have to uh, receive every issue and decide on very issues, of course, they are more and more vulnerable more and more vulnerable. So this is the thing that I don't think that this should be the way that we should resolve the problems. Okay, if the if I try to point it out that uh, reconciliations cannot lead to reconciliations, I mean the reconciliation bill con cannot lead to reconciliations, the charter change would lead to uh, more the, a difficult situation for the country. What shall we do? What shall we do? I would say that we have to allow the existence of the uh, divergence political views. We are now having a very uh, right-wing uh, ideas, left-wing idea, moderate, uh, or the center, right, center, left, extreme, left, extreme right, we are now having something like in the West that the people do having different 
ideas how to resolve the countries, how to develop the country. But it's, it's quite new for the Thais. So the Thais still hope that they want the country to go back in the, tradi uh, in the traditional belief, the consensus, to see compromise, to see unity and no difference, political views, so on and so forth, which cannot be worked out now and in the future. Because our society has been developed to such a way that you cannot ask the people to share the same political idea with you. Even among the academicians, they speak among themselves. They're debating among themselves. You are a radical, you are revolutionary, you are progressive, you are conservative, you are uh, uh, liberal, so on and so forth. So, so things turn out to be that way if we want to develop our democracy. So we have to allow the existence of this. But the question, the question is this, how we allow them to live in peace? no violent crashes you see some sorts of how can we work the so-called unity in diversities in terms of political differences which is not very easy to to uh, to achieve nevertheless we have to try uh, you cannot resolve everything through legislature that's almost impossible uh, the people who are who are trained to be larger believe themselves that um, every problems in the country need to be resolved to constitutions, to legislatures, to laws and everything. Because they believe that law can resolve everything. But it turned out to be that they solve nothing. The fact that we are having 18 constitutions in the past 80 years confirm this, that legislature doesn't resolve anything. So we have to do something more in terms of uh, to, uh, to reconcile the conflict. What shall we do? Justice. Can we develop some source of justice in our society? We cannot rely heavily on law. Kundan Ken is now, uh, uh, Mekako is now starting a justice system in the country. He might be able to say something more about, about our, uh, our rule of law here. I, I would say that, you see, uh, justice, you see, uh, not only in terms of legal system, but just in terms of social justice, economic justice. The people at the low, I'm sorry, people at the low level seem to be quite unhappy the way they were treated, have been treated by officers, by capitalists, by investors. You see, that's why they join hand with anybody who promised them to help them to relieve from poverty, to relieve them from injustice. And they want to live uh, in a very uh, happy way. Uh, and they want to see that the, all the resources, the natural resources in their community has been fairly, uh, fairly um, uh, uh, utilized, not for the benefit of any particular groups or any particular people. So, so I would say that strengthen uh, the community democracies is very important. As the presidents of political development council, we are now working hard in the past two or three years to de develop the string of democracy at the grassroots, to make them stand on themselves, to make them fight for themselves. And we do believe that democracy needs a very solid foundation. In the past, you see, we seem to resolve the country problems through the structure at the top. The constitution, legislature, parliaments, and so on and so forth. And we forget that the foundation of our democracy is very weak. The people sector, the people power is very weak. So we need to do something to, the, to strengthen the development of democracy at the local level. It is a must that we have to do. It's a very difficult job and it takes time. It might take a decades, but, uh, some, but there must be someone to do this. So this would help. Uh, to reconcile the conflict rather than anything else. So I, I, I don't mean that uh, you cannot amend the constitution. You, can, uh, you cannot enact any laws to make a justice 
in our society. Of course, but the law and constitutions are not only one answers. You need to do something more to reconcile the conflict. So, what shall we do? Uh, the 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 movement, the research movement, continue uh, to. I don't want to use words indoctrinate. Continue to inform the people at the local levels regularly, constantly through their radio programs, local radio programs, as well as their TV's program. They're doing a lot in terms of uh, inform, quote unquote, people on their ideologies. And they do hope that one of these days, the people there would drop, would forget about their tradition, uh, belief, and they do hope that the traditional belief will be eroded. They believe something like a, a, constant, a constant drop of water wears away the stone. So one of these days, the belief in traditional way of life among the rural people will be eroded and they are willing to accept a new idea proposed by the move movement. So this is the thing that they are doing now. If you go to the countryside, the northeast, uh, just listen to the local radio program, listen to the uh, the Red Church channel. You can see, you can see the way they try to inform the people what the country need most in terms of social and political change. So the government must do something in order to uh, to. Uh, uh, to look into this issue, you see. The government try to stay away from these two issues, like uh, they want to stay away the reconciliation bills, you know, the government bills, uh, the charter chain is not the char, it's not, uh, it's not proposed by the government, but people know quite well that there is no separation between the government and the government parties and the racial movement. So the government can propose, can force the movement, particularly the radical movement in the region, that don't try to rush anything. You don't have to rush the reconciliation bill. You don't have to rush the, the constitutional change, you see. Could you try to make haste slow? To make haste slow, slow down a bit for the sake of Thai society. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if not, I have one question. If Ajahn said that law alone cannot create justice, so how the justice can be created? Ajahn suggests that we have to slow down and try to allow the moderate view to be present. So is this any mechanism? I think the floor might ask Ajahn about the constitution, but Ajahn already said that the con changing constitution alone cannot create peace and stability, so what will be a bad scenario? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, uh, we cannot rely only on laws and constitution. That doesn't mean that law and constitution cannot uh, resolve anything. But my point is, you see, in the past we relied too much on laws, legislatures, and constitutions. We need to do something more. If you want to, uh, to do something that social justice uh, and economic justice, you see, we have to strengthen the people to fight for their interests, to fight for themselves. In, now the people at the local level is a part of the patronage system. Uh, the patron used to be the military people. The patron used to be high-ranking government officers. Now the patron is their, uh, is their economic boss in local community, Asia. You see, the rice, uh, the rice mill owners and all that, you see, uh, the wealthy people are now the, uh, the, the patron. And they just simply uh, provide patronage system to the local people in exchange for their vote and they stay in power. So if we string the people, uh, communities, uh, string the democracy at th that level, they would be able to, able to counter the influence of the government officers, the abuse of power of the government officers, or the, uh, the, 
domination of the economic power of the local leader of the economic leaders there. So a kind of new balance would occur, and this would would provide more uh, social and economic justice. I would say this can be done overnight, but don't believe that Rome cannot be constructed in one day. And about uh, Thailand's uh, charter change situation, and uh, I'm sorry that I was just in the middle of your saying, so maybe I uh, understand wrongly what you said, but anyway, uh, you said that when the political party initiated the uh, constitutional change, uh, it's not so good because they have their own agenda as political party. But I think it is inevitable because they have their own political idea and that's why they exist. What I think is, uh, even though political parties have their own agenda through, as you said, conversation and some uh, cooperation with other people or other parties, they can manage through so that they can uh, come to the ideal situation. So can you uh, give any comment on that? Yeah. Well, I can think you? that uh, I agree that uh, 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 political parties, politicians uh, have their own ideas, political views, and the way they want to uh, resolve the public uh, issues. But the point at this moment that the one who proposed constitutions never said anything what they would like to see to be put in the constitution, why the, the present constitution is bad, and why they need a new one, and how the new one look like in that view, in that term, they never say, they just, okay, fine, we leave to the assembly to, to do it. We leave to the assembly, and who are in the assembly? in the constitutional assembly, you see, that there are people for, I agree with you, if the proposed, if the, I would say, if the, if the, the ones who propose the, the change of the, of the charter will come up with a rather definite idea and sell the idea to the public, what they want to see in the new charter, and try to convince the public that their idea is good, but no one said that. But they just simply, we want a new one, we want a new one, and how the new one look like, they never said. That's the problem. You see my point? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, two. Uh, can hear. Uh, no, yeah. Can I please Embassy introduce yourselves? Yeah, no, Zudin no, no, Embassy of Malaysia. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, entertaining uh, uh, lecture. Uh, what, uh, what what we see now, what I understand is that there's a collision between the judicial and the uh, legislative. So in between the judicial, between the constitutional court and the legislative and the parliament. Uh, so uh, you said that uh, you intend, Thailand intends to build up democratic uh, institution. So in this sense, uh, how and where is the principle of separation of power in this effort of uh, upholding uh, democracy. The the present constitution's balance of power and and, and separation of powers based on the same principle uh, uh, stipulated in the 1997 constitutions uh, that we continue to uh, to adopt to up to uphold a parliamentary system, which means that the cabinet must come from the parliament and must be responsible to the parliament. But a new balance of power is also established in the 1997 constitution and the present constitution as well, is that we have set up some sort of a special autonomous agency uh, to uh, oversee abuse power by the politicians because we believe that under the classical Westminster system uh, cannot work well in the case of Thailand. And we don't want to go that far to the American system, the separation power under the president system because we have a monarchy. So we have to agree that we have to do everything under the framework of cons of the constitutional monarchy and the parliamentary system of government. That's why we establish uh, some sort of uh, oversee agencies like a counter corruption commission, like the constitutional courts and administrative court, hoping that these uh, 
three or four institutions would be able uh, to to provide a new kind of power uh, balance of power uh, and try to uh, resolve the issues of uh, abusing the power by politicians. Uh, but of course, once the culture corruptions uh, commissions and constitutional and constitutional courts uh, it uh, rule, rule out something which affect politicians. Of course, uh, those who are affected wouldn't be happy at all. So when, for example, I got an experience myself, I I I, I forced the first I forced the first batch of a constitutional court judges, and one of the cases came to my court is the Kun Taksin case of the concealing his property and I was the one who who, uh, who provided the ruling that uh, Kun Taksin is, was guilty but I was in minority that's why Kun Taksin survived and people asked whether this cons but I not I was not that's a <laughs> well I'm just kidding <laughs> uh, but the point is, you see, whenever you did, you see, because the power you were given seemed to have a lot of con uh, effect on the political arena, politicians. So those who are affected feel unhappy with with uh, with whatever would happen. So in the case of this as well, in the case of the 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 court, the constitutional court, which is now. Uh, uh, Adopting the well, the deliberation is now deliberating the issue of the uh, of the charter bills whether it's unconstitutional or not. Uh, people who don't like it always argue that uh, there are the court is now intervening, uh, uh, intervening in the leg le legislations. But the court might as well say that they allow to do so because because it's a new system of balance check and balances. That, uh, that and this check and balance has seemed to work out against any legislature with the people think that uh, the legislation uh, is not uh, con uh, constitutional so they can send the case to the court so it's up to the court and we cannot presume that the court would decide against the, against the, the, the charter change it hasn't come out they hadn't come out of anything yet, but the people predicted already. I don't know why. Okay. 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 Uh, we will go to the last question, and then we will go back to the panelists. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah. I am Jaran Ditha Pichai. I know him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> former, uh, former leader of the of the Richards. and uh, thank thank very much for your criticism of Richards. But I would like to hear a little bit about the yellow. <laughs> the yellow themselves, you see. <laughs> well, uh, I, I concentrate on the shirt because they are in power. <laughs> but yellow, the, that's why we have to pay more attention to those who are in power. But the, the yellow itself, uh, of course, is is not well organized at these days because they lack leadership. Kun Chum Long and Kun Sun Thi, you see, cannot be uh, the leaders, the real leaders of the, of the Yellow Church. In the past few years, you see, they were able to do anything uh, because uh, they were able to do something uh, because because the people still still believe in, in the Yellow Church. But I don't think uh, at the moment, that's why when I talk about the conservative forces, you see, uh, they are not they are not uh, consolidated. The religious is on the decline, but the issue of reconciliations and the issue of a charter change dream to dream to strengthen their movement again because they have an issue to do. They lost the power when they organized political party. They called the Gan Mueang Mai, right? You see, and the way they campaign is really against the public taste. You see, the public cannot accept it. I myself cannot accept all the uh, on the 
uh, billboards uh, with the campaigning against the politicians that they are animals, they are beasts, uh, something like this. So I don't think it's quite well. So to that, don't 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 do anything. But the government parties believe because that the research is on the decline. That way, they are to initiate reconciliation bills, there to initiate charter chain, and then it. Uh, and this you is a is a wake up call for the yellow shirt that okay we must do something now, and they're trying to do but I don't know whether they are able to do anything or not, but don't uh, don't underestimate the conservative forces because the yellow the yellow church is not conservative force, not only conservative force there are others as well. Thank you. I have to confess that I was feeling a little heavy-hearted this morning as I set out thinking about this, this dark and difficult topic that I would have to talk about, but um, it's always nice to be here at uh, Chulalongkorn University and the faculty that originally hosted me when I did my PhD research 20 years ago. And sitting here with some old friends and seeing some old friends in the audience, I feel a, a certain lightning. Maybe I can, I can manage to, to say something. Um, but it's really a difficult time to be looking at what's going on in Thailand and these these words like reconciliation and so on can be bandied around very easily but what what are we really talking about and, and what's going on here now what and I are actually trying to write a paper together and I'm really using this paper that we are so any questions you have about anything I say please direct back to Naramon afterwards and I will sit here and smile um, and at the moment the paper is is called tentatively, well, we keep changing the title, but the first word is rec backslash conciliation. So rec conciliation rather than reconciliation um, with a question mark somewhere further on. I'm trying to work out whether there is in fact a, a, a reconciliation process. But, but we started from a different place from the issues that Ajahn Sujit was talking about just now, the, pol the politics of the reconciliation bills and so on. We, we've actually been interested in this for some time and I suppose my reason for interest in it is because of my work on a previous uh, reconciliation question which was concerning the, my last project on the south. So you may know that between 2005 and 2006 there was something called the National Reconciliation Commission which was set up by former Prime Minister Taksin Shinawat, uh, chaired by former Prime Minister Anand Panyarachun, with the Vice Chair of the very distinguished medical doctor and reformer, Dr. Prawet Wasi. And they tried to look into the causes and issues um, around the conflict in the south, the violence there, which has now claimed 5,000 lives since 2004. It's actually an incredibly important topic um, that we should perhaps have a chance to talk about again that I've been working on a lot. So in a way, the, there's a precedent for having a commission to look into questions of reconciliation in Thailand. Um, but the one that is the primary focus of this paper that we're trying to write is the more recent TRCT, the Truth for Reconciliation Commission of Thailand. So we see in English the same word coming back, but when you start to look into the details, you see some things have changed because even the word for reconciliation has changed from Samana Chan, which was the 2005 word, to Bong Dong, which is the um, 2010 word. So even the, I'm not sure whether the meaning of reconciliation has changed, but the word for reconciliation has changed during this five year period. Uh, and that's one of the things I'm still trying to, to get my head around, exactly what's going on. If we look back to, first of all, my favorite topic, because I'm, I'm more comfortable talking about what happened a few years ago in the South than I am talking about what's happening this week in Bangkok. Uh, if we look back to the National Reconciliation Commission set up to look at the South, what happened was there was a huge amount of expectation. There were 50 commissioners. They had a staggering number of meetings. They commissioned piles and piles of research reports. Uh, they produced a report which ultimately pleased very few people. I think it's fair to say that only a handful of people associated with the commission and a few others really liked the report. So the report was in many ways a disappointment. What was interesting about the report was the politics around it, the way in which it created a platform. It in some ways empowered some of the, the local leaders from the, the three southern border provinces to play a more active role in society. Uh, but the report itself 
was vague, it was wishy-washy, it didn't address the real questions, it didn't really talk seriously about the militant movement, it didn't talk seriously about autonomy or political solutions to the problem. So most of the big issues were dodged in the report, and we ended up with something which sounded wonderful, a huge amount of effort had gone into it, we had the great and the good of Thai society wheeled out, uh, but the, the result was splat, really nothing, nothing that you could take away. There, there, weren't, there wasn't much to, to work with. So in many ways, the Reconciliation Commission 2005-06 was similar to some of these constitution drafting processes that Ajahn Sajit was talking about. And what we see is a phenomenon of committee creation, um, which is familiar to anybody who's been studying Thai politics for a number of years. You set up committees of people, they're very bright people, they're very well intentioned, they do a lot of work, they go around all over the place, they write research papers and reports and they make recommendations and ultimately it doesn't go very far and what, what does come out of it tends to be torn up and rewritten after a few more years as with constitutions and with other things. So there's a process. I suppose when the Apisit government, and Ajahn Panitang can, can doubtless tell us more from the inside later on, but when the Apisit government set up a number of committees in the wake of the, the violence of March to May 2010, which is obviously at the core of a lot of the need for reconciliation here, we mustn't forget that more than 90 people were killed uh, in, in very violent and disturbing circumstances during that period. Three committees were set up by the Apisit government, one chaired by Anan, one chaired by Prawait, so the two guys from the old NRC are brought back, and another one by Kanit Nanakorn, which is the, the Truth for Reconciliation Commission of Thailand. So creating committees to try to deal with the problem is, again, a solution, but the question is always going to be, the proof will be in, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. What kind of report is the commission going to produce? Is anybody going to be interested anymore in what this kind of commission does when it finally gets round to delivering? Uh, it's a little bit, I don't know whether it's sad or curious, but the, both the Anan and Prowait committees, which had a three-year mandate, I believe, dissolved themselves just before the end of the last government, whereas the uh, Knit committee survived the transition and in some ways seems to have thrived more under the Yinglang government than under the Apisit government which created it, which is one of the, the oddities of the TRCT. What's the TRCT supposed to do? When we hear these words, um, truth and reconciliation, many of us who have a, a wider sort of interest or comparative perspective, we'll start thinking of other examples of, of similar processes. There's actually a staggering number of truth and reconciliation related commissions that have been set up all over the world. Uh, but for most people, the South African one looms large in the imagination. We have this idea that the South African truth and reconciliation process was the most successful, that the victims and the perpetrators confronted each other face to face in the room. They had some kind of showdown, uh, that this was a hugely cathartic process. People who are familiar with the South African process tell me that that's rather simplistic. Most of it wasn't like that at all. It was all um, somewhat complicated and unsatisfactory in many ways. But nevertheless, could something along those lines actually happen in Thailand? The mandate for the TRCT, three points. Investigate and determine the truth about the violence that occurred during April and May 2010. In addition, determine the root causes and precedents of the conflict and violence in the country. Now that is a, a huge, tall order. Two, recommend both short-term and long-term restoration measures for individuals, groups, organizations, and institutes that were affected by the violence. That's another pretty tall order. And the third one, recommend measures to reduce social conflict and prevent future violence and loss from occurring. And when you add all those three together, it's clear that the TRCT has an absolutely massive agenda. And how that agenda could really be pursued by an organization which has a small number of commissioners, all of whom are part-time, who are not sort of on salary, fairly limited secretariat and resources, um, a budget which apparently they couldn't get their hands on much of until very recently, and so on. So there's an enormous challenge implicit in the TRCT. Another major problem is, to quote one of the commissioners whom I interviewed the other day, um, we're basically all people who don't like taxing. So the, 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 the commissioners, for the most part, were people who were associated with the anti-taxing side or 
who had private sympathies that were not very much. I mean, you can't find anybody who's really on the quote unquote red shirt side uh, amongst the members of the commission. So you're going to have from the beginning a question about how to reconcile people, how to reach, can people from who, who are associated for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly, with one side of the political equation, are they going to be able to reach out, gain the trust of people from the other side and achieve the reconciliation? Um, but perhaps more fundamental than that, there's the question of how do you investigate and determine the truth if you don't have uh, the powers to subpoena witnesses if you can't really mobilize the necessary resources and if the cooperation that you get from state agencies, particularly the security sector, which is obviously quite important here, is relatively limited and also the, if the, the Red Shirt movement obviously is a major party to the conflict and they are mistrustful of the TRCT from the outset. So you've got a, a real problem, um, an organization with some very distinguished members um, very good intentions, but difficulties in terms of how to pursue its mandate um, and, and get anything done. Clearly, it's the truth-telling bit that's going to be really interesting to most people. How you actually promote reconciliation is difficult. But there's another question about the title, not just about the, the Thai word for reconciliation, but also it's the truth for reconciliation commission. Is achieving an understanding of the truth a prerequisite for reconciliation? Some people, including I think some members of the commission, ask, are asking themselves that question. Is it actually helpful to get to the bottom of the truth in order to achieve reconciliation? Uh, Dr. Prawait Wasi, when he dissolved his committee um, last year, gave an interview in which he said, um, Reconciliation is a thing of the past. Reform is a thing of the future. So he actually was rather down on the idea of reconciliation. Many people are skeptical that actually bringing out the truth is going to help. Um, and this, is, this goes back to a huge debate which is now going on in relation to a lot of other things, including the case just brought against uh, members of the Abhisit government to the ICC, which has been a, a manoeuvre that's been carried out, many of you will be familiar with, in, in the, the past few days. Questions about to what extent there is a culture of impunity that long precedes uh, and is much bigger than the events of March to May 2010. Can you tackle a culture of impunity with this kind of mechanism, especially if you're not doing the South African style real face-to-face -to -face confrontation, and what kind of national effort would be needed to achieve uh, um, a serious questioning of that culture of impunity? Because despite the, you know, the, the TV programs on Thai PBS talking about um, the TRCT's work and so on, it's fairly obvious that it's not exactly headline-grabbing stuff for the most part. There hasn't been a huge amount of public attention on this reconciliation process for most of the past two years. There are a few people who've been following it. And a few, uh, another criticism by the um, Australian-based scholar Tyrrell Habergon complains that the TRCT's meetings and hearings all take place at the, the Sun Rajagan out in Jeng Watana and uh, it's not exactly an, either an easy place for people to get to or an agreeable place for them to get to. There's a sense of entering um, a, you know, a very, very bureaucratized government building and going up to the top of the car park and round the corner and there you find this um, office. So it's an intimidating and dislocated setting? Wouldn't it be better if the meetings could be held somewhere uh, in the centre of the city in a more accessible location? Actually a very similar set of complaints to those that have been made in the case of the Khmer Rouge Tribunal which, which happens at a, a military base on the outskirts of Phnom Penh rather than in one of many perfectly suitable locations in the centre of the city. So can you really set up the conditions to build confidence in a process when you, you've got the process physically located in that sort of place. It's a secondary question, but perhaps it, it indicates the questions of the commitment uh, and dedication of resources and serious thought um, involved in this process. Now the problem that we've got with our paper uh, is wonderful up to now uh, for the scene setting bit. Uh, we haven't got the report yet. Um, and I, you know, I went with uh, 
Titanel and I were in a conference in Norway and I'd gone there in the hope of being able to give this paper talking about what was in the report but the report hasn't come out yet. We're expecting the report uh, in the next two to three weeks and then we will know what the TRCT has been able to do. If you talk to people associated with the TRCT, obviously the core of the report is the fact finding. What are they going to say about what actually happens? They've come up with a, a specific list of key incidents of violence and so on. They claim that they're going to be able to, to give substantive insight into what happened in a number of those incidents. Uh, it doesn't seem they're very enthusiastic about really naming any names of perpetrators of violence. Um, again, that's a, a controversy. Does a truth and reconciliation process have to say who actually carried out particular acts? Is that a, a precursor to the process or is that actually an obstacle? Does it then start to focus too much on personalization and you, you're going to lose um, the wider social focus? That's a debate amongst people who work on these questions internationally. But it doesn't look as though the TRCT is going to go down the road of really saying who, who carried out these acts uh, in a great deal of detail. And that's going to be, if that's the case, that's going to be an, a source of criticism from uh, the red shirt movement. Meanwhile, you know, the reconciliation processes themselves haven't been reconciled because the People's Information Center, which is uh, an alternative, a differently funded organization with, shall we say, a more sympathetic stance to the red shirt movement is currently developing its own report, which again is going to be finished sometime in the next uh, few days or weeks. And we're going to have not just one report about what uh, apparently happened in 2010, but two competing reports of, about what's happened in 2010, which it would be too simplistic to say they're reports produced by two rival sides to the conflict, but nevertheless, um, there's a sense in which they're likely to offer very, very contrasting views of the same events. We're then going to be left, instead of um, having a, a unified and reconciled report, everybody who's really interested in this issue is gonna to have to look side by side at these two reports, along with other um, documents and other evidence that's being generated. Meanwhile, as you know, the parliamentary process has in some ways come in and forestalled a lot of the focus on the Truth for Reconciliation Commission's impending report. We ended up with the, the so-called reconciliation bills um, presented to Parliament. I was in Parliament on the day that the debate was taking place when the Speaker's chair was being moved around and so on. It was a very uh, exciting day. I managed unfortunately to leave the Parliament building just before the, the scene of the action uh, sort of culminated in that incident but the atmosphere was palpably tense. Um, are these bills actually reconciliation bills? Are they essentially amnesty bills? What are these bills? In a sense, the bills come out of or are linked to another process, which is the, the KPI, King Pichadipok Institute report, um, which is sort of a, a third strand of substantial, weighty Thai committee documentation uh, going along the same lines, but not emphasizing the truth telling, but emphasizing how you could do uh, root causes and what solutions you'd come up with. So. How are we supposed to link all these things together? Um, unfortunately, the word reconciliation has been sort of hijacked by this parliamentary discussion about reconciliation bills, and we've all rather lost sight of the earlier notion of a reconciliation process driven by this committee. Um, I was sort of hoping we would get a little bit more closure too on the reconciliation bills and have a stronger sense of whether these bills were going to be passed or, or what was actually going to happen to them. Everything, as quite often seems to happen in Thailand just when it's getting exciting, seems to be on hold. Um, perhaps uh, my two uh, friends and colleagues will be able to give us some insight into, into what may or may not be about to happen next. What we do know is that these reports are about to be published. There seems to be a huge disconnect between the the reconciliation process with a focus on truth telling and getting to the bottom of what happened and the political process of a, a piece of legislation, call it a reconciliation bill, call it an amnesty bill, whatever it is. Um, how far does the reconciliation move down from 
the upper echelons of the political level lower down. Certainly when I've been out in Nissan, I was out in Nissan northeast the other week and in Chiang Mai last week and I'll be in Nissan again at the end of this week. Uh, you know, when you talk to people who have red shirt sympathies, they are certainly becoming increasingly sceptical or detached from the government, which doesn't mean they're in any way about to forsake the Thai government and turn to the Democrats, but there's definitely a, a bit of a fissure opening up and a lot of unease about the reconciliation process, even amongst the quote-unquote pro-Taxin side. So there's quite a lot of tension inside the forces that, that are supporting and probably will still continue to support the government about what exactly is going on. So lots and lots of questions for you, alas. I wish I had answers, but as usual, Thailand has fascinating questions and, and answers are just a week or two away, uh, then we'll figure out what's actually going to happen. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dan Ken McCargo at least uh, tell us that it's not the reconciliation, it's more on the amnesty. So I think those who are interested on the issue of the debate about the reconciliation, we possibly have to look at the issue. And I think those who read the four recon so-called reconciliation bill might see that in fact the big debate is the amnesty bill or not. But anyway, uh, the, I will ask the people to hold the question later. Now we go to uh, um, Dr. Ajahn. Ajahn. Yes. Uh, it's a correction of Duncan's speech. Uh, can you wait a little bit? One As I said, it's because it's linked together. I think okay. it's important because it's, it kind of goes into the mind of the... Uh, uh, can you do it quickly? One minute. Uh, we'll do, yeah. A half minute. Uh -huh. uh, Duncan, hi. Uh, the commit. Uh, I belong to the uh, assembly of the reform of Thailand under mm. John Perway. Mm. We are still working. Mm. Mm. Okay. We are meeting every month twice at least, yeah. and uh, for that reason, we are not terminated. Okay. Uh, secondly, Kunanan has uh, offered the government for to terminate uh, for the fact that he felt obliged that he was a former Prime Minister of Thailand. Therefore, there is a political uh, liability for him to be there. When he actually offered the, election, uh, the termination to the present government, he let it be known that if he re-elected again, he would continue to do his job, which still has a two years mandate left. Uh, and he had that full intention of serving it uh, in all, to the point whereby he didn't actually pick up his belongings. Since he somehow was not uh, re, uh, what re-elected, he has to go back and collect his belongings. So that's the fact. Okay? Like to ask Dan, yeah, to give us the uh, the idea about the possibility of the reconciliation and charter chain and Ajahn may offer a new scenario for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn Nalimon, Ajahn Titinan Nankin. Great. Great to see you again, uh, although you look worried, uh, <laughs> uh, as always. Uh, but uh, uh, it's good to be here again, uh, uh, and uh, I'm delighted uh, to uh, to be able to uh, to come here and to share my thoughts uh, with you. Uh, I'll try to stick to to the original assignment, uh, that is to talk about the underpinnings and the scenarios, uh, keeping up with the spirit of reconciliation. Uh, not not recklessly, uh, as Duncan suggested. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Thai politics uh, is fascinating. I I'm sure you know very well. Uh, uh, with uh, 31 months uh, in 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 political office, uh, and of course 30 years uh, on as a student of politics, I remember uh, began my study of Thai politics in 1979. And graduated with a with a degree in political science in in, in 1982. 
uh, I can tell you that uh, I am still a student of politics. Uh, what I say may be wrong, so uh, you cannot rely on me too much on that. But from time to time, I will draw in uh, 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 observations from, from many artists, especially today. I, I will rely uh, to keep me honest uh, to, uh, uh, and, and, and look into the uh, works of others, uh, political historians, for example, people like B.J. Turville who wrote a very one, wonderful book on Thai political history uh, from, it, from 13th century uh, uh, to present days, to recent times. And if you complete his book, you, you'll be able to painting the underpinnings and scenarios by yourself. And I think you will arrive with a very interesting conclusions. Uh, for me, there are three underpinnings uh, in, in Thai politics uh, at the moment. Uh, the first is, of course, uh, changes. Uh, tremendous changes in Thai society. Uh, if, if, if you look at uh, uh, from the beginning of the 13th century and uh, to the days that we drawn, uh, we draw our borders uh, in 1890s uh, to the day that uh, uh, Bangkok was founded uh, uh, in 1782 to the day that we changed our name of the country uh, from Siam to Thailand in uh, 1939. Population expanded. Uh, uh, tremendously from 2 to 3 million to now 65 million. That's a huge uh, 20 to 30 times increase in terms of population in only two centuries. That really uh, added a lot of uh, pressure and that explained a lot of uh, forces uh, behind changes uh, today. Um, economy is also expanded uh, tremendously. You look at the beginning of Bangkok when uh, about 10 million rai is utilized. Now, 150 million rice is utilized. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, more, more than 50% of the people, of, of Thai people, are still in the agricultural sector. Although from time to time, they come to Bangkok uh, to work as taxi drivers, uh, food store sellers. But still, more than 50%. Uh, that hasn't changed that much uh, when I was growing up. 80% of the people uh, recorded in the agricultural sector. Of course, Thai society had changed uh, significantly. Uh, in only 80 years uh, since uh, 1932, which we moved quite interestingly from Thai Butari absolute state to an authoritarian state. And now we are in the midst of the transitional democ democratic state within 30, 30 years only. Uh, that's quite a change. Uh, and this is um, uh, my first obs observation. These changes are underpinning uh, a lot of uh, conflicts, a lot of uh, demand, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of activities. Uh, no wonder people are very, very unhappy with the structure, with the system. Because uh, when I began teaching here uh, in 1983, uh, 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 we only received uh, about 30 students, uh, 60 students in our inter international relations. Uh, Several years on, 15 years on, still, we can only receive 60 students. Outside Chulalongkorn University, 80, 800,000 people increase every year. You know, we have 1 million births, uh, 200,000 died. So 800,000 people added each year. And can you imagine how many people wanted to get into our department each year? Our uh, 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 admission system is more and more competitive. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't imagine to be born in this century and try to get into Jura Longkorn, of course, the best university in Thailand, uh, I, I, I can claim. Uh, well, if you're interested in these changes, we do have a lot of classes, wonderful classes on campus for you. I don't have time to talk more, but we have a series of classes to, uh, to, to uh, to educate uh, us on how Thai society is moving forward from traditional society to modern society at this faculty and many other faculties. I think this is number one. And let people spend more time on, 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 on analyzing these changes, uh, fundamental changes, fundamental uh, uh, foundations und underpinning our problems. Uh, second is, of course, forces. Forces behind, behind, the, behind the trouble, behind politics. Uh, uh, to me, uh, interestingly, I, I think there are three major forces. One is the establishment forces. Uh, Ajahn Sujit may say uh, conservative forces. Uh, these are the uh, monarchy, uh, these are the uh, military, these are the bureaucracy, uh, these are the business uh, uh, elite, and these are the people who, interestingly, as B.J. Uh, Turville said, over 13, from the 13th centuries, haven't changed that much. 
you know it's a Thai people they don't change that much in the last 10 uh, 10 15 centuries on the eating habit on the uh, body language on the attitude toward, toward the authority you know on the friendliness uh, toward foreign uh, people uh, throughout difficult times colonization globalization the friendliness of the Thai people hasn't changed uh, and of course the Chinese factor in Thailand hasn't changed that much uh, since the beginning of Bangkok uh, and of course the military uh, the bureaucracy the the, um, the, the, the the elite are still uh, very much uh, uh, recognizable formidable forces that will that include to me uh, Thaksin I will include Thaksin in the establishment uh, forces. Uh, he himself uh, is the uh, uh, living example of how uh, an established elite is, uh, and that is him. And, and, and I think, but more interestingly, in the uh, forces, uh, I would say political parties also uh, rise up very interestingly. Uh, and, and this is a second uh, force behind uh, what's going on. The Thai uh, party formed uh, in uh, July. Uh, 1998, uh, 14th of July. It's 14 years on, I think it won five major elections, if you don't count it, uh, 2006. Uh, uh, first election, uh, 248 seats uh, in 2001. Second election, 2005, 374. A, a, big, uh, a big increase of one. Uh, 127 seats uh, and, and uh, of course 206 it was nude but of course stunned uh, the, to the observer in 2007 after the coup uh, Tyrak Thai won 226 seats uh, and of course uh, the last election it won uh, 265 that's not surprising uh, uh, considering a lot of factors along with Pur Thai, Tyrak Thai or Palang Bacha Chon PPP uh, party, of course, it's, it's the same Thai Thai, but in the different forms. Uh, Democrat also rise up very interestingly. Uh, from the first election, uh, 128 seats. Uh, second election, 2005, 96 seats, and uh, 2007, 166, and now 159. Uh, the two parties system is emerging in Thailand, and in the last two uh, elections, you see more stability. In this election, you have seen two parties leading uh, in the elections. You see about 10 other parties, smaller parties, forming coalition, more or less uh, five to six parties forming a uh, coalition party. Uh, I think this trend will, st will tend to stay. But interestingly, the, the, uh, the trend for Pua Thai is downward uh, from a million, 20 million strong supporters in the first few elections to now only 15 million. And more interestingly, um, for the Democrat, uh, they went up from a medium-sized party to a bigger party. Now their supporters are uh, from the party list is 11.4 million. Uh, if you don't count the no vote you know, uh, uh, last time, uh, about uh, uh, 1.5 million, and uh, and and the bad uh, ballots uh, is about 2.5 uh, million. Uh, I think Democrat is edging closer. Uh, to poor Thai in the last uh, two elections. That is very interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, finally, you may have a more uh, two big party competing in the next few elections. Um, if they only can establish and in insti institutionalize their own party, uh, it will be a, a question of if Khun Thaksin is not around, what will happen to uh, Thai Rak Thai, but Demo Democrat it seems to be here to stay and struggling uh, uh, to absorb a bigger role, a, a bigger platform, and of course the leadership chain will, will come in the Democrat, and it will be interesting to see uh, if they can maintain that. If the two parties can maintain that, uh, I think these forces will be even out um, and it will not cause any trouble in the parliamentary uh, polit politics. But of course, the last force that I'm very much interested in is the people's power, from the NGO uh, to the PAD to, to the UDD. Uh, of course, the UDD rise is very recent. I think they established, if I'm not correct, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on the 15th of June 2007, uh, almost one year uh, after the... Uh, uh, after the uh, after the uh, uh, coup, uh, they did a very, they did very well uh, in 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 pushing their uh, issues. Uh, what issues? I will come to the third point of, of the forces. But but interestingly, um, after the uh, after the uh, demonstrations uh, in Bangkok, I think you did make a great mistake. Uh, uh, and uh, and on, on that, I will draw on the BJ Terrell on page uh, three uh, hundred and twelve. Uh, he observed that the, the dramatic fires, I quote, uh, that destroyed the buildings 
in one of Bangkok's main commercial areas shocked many. It may have helped vent the anger of the extreme section of the UDD, but at the same time, it annihilated uh, their image of being an essential, peaceful, and democratic organization. On the contrary, it deprived them of being considered martyrs to the notable cause. Uh, with high size, it would seem that the UDD leadership had been overconfident uh, that they could impose their view on the government to the sheer number of the demonstrators. They had miscalculated, uh, miscalculated the strength of the Prime Minister opposition. Uh, that was based uh, on the fact that uh, the Prime Minister also uh, has been uh, democratically elected. And I think uh, if this trend of the UDD miscalculation continues, uh, you may see more problems on the street. I think, but the rise of them is nevertheless a, a phenomenon and very interesting. Uh, there are more works coming out from many students. Uh, uh, one, of course, uh, is quite, quite interesting. The, uh, it's called Red Journals by the Harvard student. Uh, it describes what inside the movement in the last uh, a few months when he supposedly to write his dissertation, turn around and write about the Red Church instead. And now his book is out. And I think uh, if you read that carefully, you understand what the UDD compositions are. Uh, it's very complex. Uh, I, I think this is a, a, the, the, the second force. The third force and more fundamental uh, to me is the uh, is a confrontation between uh, democratic rules uh, versus constitutional constitutional rules and I think this is the heart of the of the problem uh, for Thailand uh, why I say that uh, interestingly BJ Turbio also uh, say that uh, uh, he wrote this uh, before the election he said these coming elections uh, most of servers would agree uh, will constitute a watershed if poor Thai uh, wins it will want to rectify the record and be compensated for what they feel is a long period of judicial harassment. But if the Democrats succeed in winning, a Pisic may well try to consolidate his power or uh, his position by proceeding to implement the fifth and final part of the roadmap, the reconciliation plan, the part that has received almost no comments from political observers, and that is to reform the democratic rules, uh, to make sure that uh, this transitional uh, rules will not be manipulated by uh, one person, especially from the establishment forces. Uh, Kuntak Sin tried that, recalling uh, when he, uh, at the height of his power, trying to change the law in one night to save him 600 uh, million baht uh, uh, taxes paying to the uh, Thomas Seng uh, 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 deals, uh, immediately sparked a, a, a riot. Uh, it is very clear to me that the fundamental underpinnings uh, uh, for the confrontation is about transition uh, in Thai society from a uh, transitional democracy to a more established democracy. Uh, and by that, uh, you need to reform the democratic rules. And of course, conservative forces, establishment forces, including Thaksin, may try to manipulate that and, and use that to their own use. And if they do that, you have right on the street. You have UDDs, you have PAD, you have no colleges, you have professors from Julas, Tamasat, you have students, you have people uh, from overseas, you know, American dressed in red, you know, uh, European dressed in yellows, uh, joy the forces protesting uh, because they love this country too much. What is at stake is they don't want to allow anyone to manipulate uh, that uh, transition uh, anymore. And I think Kuntak Sin may realize that this is why uh, seeing uh, opposition rising up very strong, uh, seeing that the constitution change, seeing that the reconciliation uh, proposal may be portrayed, may be understood, may be pushed uh, to benefit him alone. And he know that he knows for sure that that will call for a even stronger opposition. Uh, before Kuntak Sin left this country, there were no Facebook, uh, there were no Twitter, there were no 100 plus satellite TVs, uh, there were no uh, knowledge uh, in the hands of the people uh, like today. So I think uh, it is very clear uh, these underpinning uh, forces. Uh, I think that, uh, that my first uh, 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 assignment that I deliver uh, to you. Uh, second assignment is of course scenarios. I I will go very brief and short. You know, uh, it's not good to go into CIO too much. You know, it's dangerous for your career because you could be wrong. You know, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I would say that uh, there will be three also scenarios. Uh, uh, first is of course uh, certainties. 
certainties. I think we are moving into a more established parliamentary system. Uh, parliamentary system is here to stay. Uh, of course, uh, recent, uh, recent uh, problems in, 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 in the parliament worries ordinary people. But if you look at MPs fighting in the democratic parliament, uh, it's not different from Taiwan, from South Korea, from others. Uh, if you look at the fierce uh, fights between MPs in many European countries, I think it's the same. But I think uh, uh, more and more we are moving, more and more we are, we are uh, established uh, uh, this mechanism. And it's very essential to improve upon it, to make sure that parliamentary system uh, uh, focus on uh, changing the, uh, the rules, making it more democratic. Uh, I think uh, at the moment uh, you have problems. Uh, people who are elected uh, for the past uh, decade uh, worry that, uh, they told us that they worry that the quality of the MPs are less and less these days. But I think this is a temporary period. I, I think we have no other choices. Uh, and and in, the next, uh, in the next few years after uh, we, we, we go past this conflict, I think the, the quality of the parliamentary system will be improved uh, judging from the new generations of MPs coming, they are more sophisticated, uh, they are more ready uh, to engage in the democratic rules. And, 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 and this is not only the parliamentary system, at the local level, local administrations, uh, uh, and even in the bureaucracy, you see new, new bloods coming out. Uh, of course, these people are affected by the, the last two or three decades of changes and last two or three decades of conflict. They are determined to make the system better. That's number one. And number two, what is less certain, what is less established uh, is, of course, the, the ability of the administration, the leadership uh, to handle uh, the, uh, uh, the short-term crisis. Uh, uh, you, uh, of course, uh, from time to time, you have an able uh, leadership. But what we have is a leader without the leadership. We have the head of the government without uh, uh, having a great quality of the leadership, uh, and, and it's problematic. I think the current prime minister is not doing uh, that bad, is doing not that bad, uh, but of course her popularity is, is coming down and down. I suggest you to watch Isan Po, in, uh, rather than Son Duset Po or our other Po, which make um, more mistakes in the past. Isan poll is very interesting. It, it's based in Konkan. And in the recent poll, uh, it uh, suggested that uh, uh, more and more people uh, are moving away from, 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 from voting for uh, Thai, uh, 44% against 39% this time, moving away. And Prime Minister popularity is eroding, uh, only slightly increase in the economic uh, performance simply because the prices of gasoline and food is now stabilized. But trouble ahead. Uh, of course, Prime Minister has a soft approach, soft spoken. And after all, she's pretty. I like to look at her. You know, it is suiting, it's comforting. But uh, nothing else, nothing else. She's not able to, to, to move up, you know, to, to handle even more simple cases like uh, a NASA project uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we benefit uh, and, and we gain a friendship from, from the United States as well as China. And I think this is problematic. She needs to emerge uh, soon uh, away from Kun uh, the uh, direct uh, directions and, and establish her own. She, she still have a chance, you know, because, uh, but of course her, popul her popular popularity is now uh, past the peak. And, 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 and that is, uh, of course, uh, problematic for her. Uh, lastly, of course, uh, lastly, of course, uh, uh, the conflict on the streets, uh, the, uh, this scenario is, is more and more likely, more and more likely. If parliamentarians, if uh, NGOs, if the academics are not able to st to steer away the uh, reconciliation and charter chain from uh, personal issues, from personalized politics into the agenda of the country, uh, it is very clear that people uh, will come on the street demanding uh, changes uh, for themselves. And I think uh, it doesn't help to have a radio R Rwanda style yelling, uh, telling people to kill each other, uh, calling people to come out, attacking e each other. The uh, Gosoto the uh, new uh, body, uh, is in transition, not able uh, to control uh, these uh, radios and televisions. I suggest you to turn on the radio. You'll be able to predict what will happen. This radio will is calling people to come out, killing each other.
capture your wife, rape your children. Uh, this is specific, specific messages they said to the Prime Minister Pisit when he was in power. Just go to Jula Longkorn, capture his wife, capture his children, kill his children. You know, uh, he's, a, he's a murderer. Of course, the Thai people with the good quality and good sense, common sense, may not sway, may not swing by these hate messages. But if you keep allowing these people to control the airwaves like this, uh, soon enough, uh, th these people will, uh, will confront each other. Yeah. In the last two or three days, we discovered that people who went and confront uh, each other when Democrat has rallied are the, are the people organized by radio stations. Uh, and in the last uh, few uh, times in Chiang Mai and in other places, the same thing. In Kongan, the same thing. They listen to the radio. They come out uh, on the uh, on on the streets. I, I think for those who are very familiar with this uh, phenomenon, you know very well what will happen. So it is the interest of the prime ministers and his people to control these people and make sure that uh, these changes and reconciliation proposal are moving toward a right direction. And I am still hopeful uh, because uh, after all, uh, we all uh, have the stake in it. And, uh, and I think uh, no, no parties are hegemon uh, in the Thai society. They, in other words, they do not have enough power to override each other. So they may need to reconcile uh, among themselves and make sure that uh, they are not, uh, they are not uh, bringing the Thai society down. I think uh, in, in that, uh, in that uh, sense, uh, I'll end my observation and, and, and I'll be happy to answer some of the questions.